Who else needs a deep breath after that roller coaster of emotions? <laughs> What a great film. Thank you all for coming out tonight and watching the biggest little farm documentary. Uh, my name is Arohi Sharma. I work as a soil health advocate and water policy analyst for an environmental nonprofit, the Natural Resources Defense Council. We have an office in Santa Monica, and you're welcome to come and tour anytime. <laughs> I have the distinct privilege of moderating the Q&A today. We have about 20 minutes, maybe 25 if I can squeak it out, of time for questions and answers from, from you all with our distinguished guest, the Mr. <laughs> John Chester. <laughs> How are you? Thank you. How um, many times have you seen this film? Um, I first want to say that uh, Molly uh, sends her regrets. She's got um, farm duty tonight, so. <laughs> and a four-year-old to take care of. So, sorry about that. Um, I've, I've seen it a number of times. Number of times. Actually, we have, um, we have one person from the crew, a pretty important person. If you've ever tried to uh, run a farm, make a film, stay married, and raise a <laughs> four-year-old, you can't do it without a producer. Um, and Sandra Keats, can you stand up? So, uh, and by, by producer, I mean like on the ground and actually had chores on the weekends for two and a half years. <laughs> and she tried to quit the business and I heard about her trying to quit the business. I didn't know her, but I heard she was good and she was trying to quit the business and the producer who told me about her said, she's quitting the business because she's gonna go start a goat farm. I was like, have her stop by on the way out. <laughs> and uh, she didn't leave for two and a half years. <laughs> All right, let's jump right into it. So I feel like this documentary came out during a really important week. On Monday, a UN group of scientists, world-renowned scientists, came together and issued their global assessment on biodiversity and the trajectories and the... Um, the claims that were made in this report are pretty harrowing in terms of species degradation, species loss and extinction. I think one of the, when it comes to agriculture and farming, the, the key statistic that popped out the most was that 23% of our world's lands are degraded. I mean, when it comes to, you know, the, the work that you do on Apricot Lane Farms, like how closely does that relate to, you know, the, the land degradation and the plant species loss claims that were in the report? Well, uh, so, the, you know, it's interesting because we came to a farm that had been depleted of its biodiversity through 45 years of extractive, you know, methods that were used in order to grow food cheaply, which were all complicit in supporting, and, you know, it's just where we've all landed, and we're trying to work our way around that. But w in reawakening the ecosystem, the whole goal is to bring back the biodiversity because it is the self-regulating immune system of not only the planet, but of the farm. So this method of farming is, is it's great and, and then it lines up with that report and then the whole, the whole point of this regenerative method is, is, is really to maximize biodiversity as a way to help regulate against epidemics of pests and disease. It's a microcosm of the larger planetary immune system, again, which we call an ecosystem. So there is a direct correlation between species diversity and the happiness of that ecosystem. But I think we all kind of intuitively knew that. <laughs> Just helps to have a report finally put yeah, it on paper. <laughs> yeah. well, last question I'll ask before I open it up to the audience. Hopefully y'all have been ruminating on the hard questions to ask John. Um, there's a great moment in the clip where or in the documentary where you say observation and creativity are your biggest allies. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Um, yeah. It's actually a quote I learned from Joel Salatin, um, and he finishes it with the one that I should have finished it with, and that is observation followed by creativity followed by humility. I should have given Joel credit. <laughs> um, but it's true in that you, you have to be accepting of the failure and know that your solution that you thought was going to work didn't work so that you can open back up and begin to observe. And I think the thing that I learned through the whole experience, you know, um, that was most profound to me was the um, acknowledgement of how embarrassment is like this ingredient that drives fear, anxiety, and anger into like uh, qu 
quick repair to cover embarrassment because with every failure there was this wave of embarrassment and then quickly try to recover by fixing it. And, and you would fix it too quickly before you understand the complexity of it. And so to sit back and observe it, to your question, and really understand what fuels it. You know, why does it exist and what eats it or what balances it? And approach it then with three or, f we always say three solutions to every problem, which is a, uh, which is a, f a feeble human attempt at what the ecosystem does because it offers sometimes thousands of solutions to the same problem, but over the course of maybe five years to a thousand years, you know? Um, so I think observation is an incredibly important part and a slow response is an incredibly important part to a more profound and uh, long-lasting solution to environmental and agricultural problems. That aha moment when the ducks were released into the orchards, that was palpable in this theater. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna open it up to questions from you beautiful people, and please remember, questions end in a question mark, so try to keep your soliloquies as small as possible. All right. Could you explain how you found that this wonderful guy who knew all this stuff and what his background was? Did he have a farm himself? And also, how did you, how did you get the dog to not eat the chickens? Okay. <laughs> So how did we find Alan York? Um, that was really Molly's doing. She was uh, she looked up, you know, certifications have become like religions. So there's like polarizing even elements there where if you're you're biodynamic, you're permaculture, and we are certified biodynamic, and we we use that as a as a sort of a, a compass and a direction. But we use permaculture. We use holistic methods. We use, I mean, how we use the methods used by the, the eco ecosystem that were developed over 4.5 billion years. So I say that just to say that we are biodynamically certified, but that's not all we practice. Molly looked online, and that was the only thing that she could find that was close to a certification that matched this idea of like a whole system ecosystem. And Alan York's name kept popping up, and so she found him. He was actually traveling all over the world as a consultant to vineyards. There's a lot of vineyards that have taken on the biodynamic methods. And it was, it was perfect. It's not in the film, but it's like it was like a movie. She, he rejected her three times, which is like the hero's <laughs> journey, right? Three rejections. And then finally, she's, he goes, you want nothing to do with this? Click. And she's like, no, 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 I really want to do it. He really, he goes, it's going to take you forever. You're never going to stick to it. You're, you know, I don't know if you've got investors, but they're going to hate you. And that was it. And then she called him back. She's like, you're literally the only person that is gonna help us, um, that can do it, that sees it. And he came down and, and showed up. And he had always wanted to apply this biodynamic method to a farm that grew a lot of different things. Um, so it was a dream come true for him. Yeah. And the last question. Oh, the guardian dogs. Oh, the guardian dogs. You d there's, no, there's no science to it. You just put a dog in. If it doesn't eat the chicken, then that's the one that guards the dogs. <laughs> And then sometimes a week later, it, it, we did, this is the truth, maybe this is too much, but you, you guys are kind of farmers now. But we like, I remember we put these other two dogs in and they were like, the interns came to me and they're like, oh my God, Sage and Basil are eating the chickens. I'm like, how many do they eat? He said, two. I said, Coyote's got them by 350, keep them in. <laughs> because it was, I mean, in one killing, I could lose 150 chickens. And after a couple of chickens lost their life, they stopped eating chickens and I haven't lost a chicken in a year and a half from a coyote. So, I mean, it, you have to make those very tough, lesser e two evils decisions. Let's go back there. How did you convince You can't convince anyone. They have to have a lens for it. That's your partner. You know, and I think if they don't see it already and have a, f a, a way of looking at this with the right perspective, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, partner with them. It's a really important question. The question was, how did we find the right financiers to, to you know, how do we present it and sell it to them, right? And I, and I, and I immediately when we talked about the idea of what we were going to do, there was a, a immediate connection. They had already wanted something like that. They saw that as the future, you know, food grown with great depth of flavor, with high levels of nutrient density, in an ecologically restorative way. Investing in values. Let's go to the lady in the second row. Why do the coyotes kill so many chickens without eating them? I, I don't know, but I've also been told that that doesn't happen. But it does. 
You, you know, I, if I would have, uh, dogs, dogs do that. We've had dogs kill, neighbors' dogs kill. They do that. They kill everything and just leave most of it. But if I hadn't seen on two occasions coyotes leaving the scene after those massacres, I would have thought it was like a raccoon or a neighbor's dog. But we saw, we saw the coyotes. I got you beat. <laughs> she said she cried 17 times. <laughs> what was the first question? Real quick. Uh, uh, how can the public support? How can the public support? That's a great question, and she's not related. Um, <laughs> but I think that's the point. Like, I think there's a lot of people that feel very strongly about this, and we want to point fingers at large-scale agriculture and, and blame them. You know, We want to point fingers at Monsanto and blame them. And we're so into confrontation, you know, but what we have to acknowledge is that we've all become complacent in the last 70 years. And in that complacency, we've lost innovation. And we've lost the encouragement of people like us and other farmers who are doing this to innovate and the failure that, that goes along with that and the expense that goes along with that. The only way we're going to get around large-scale industrialized ag and the use of chemicals is to have innovation around it, right? So solutions are the way, and so that it has to be supported by consumers willing to pay for food and for what it really costs. I mean, maybe you can't buy the most expensive food all the time, but you need to be conscious about those decisions. I mean, and for your own good, too. I mean, there's higher levels of, it's scientifically proven, there's data on you know, the nutrient density in, in foods grown in soil that have that availability. And the second part of your question was, how did you maintain the losses? I mean, it was really hard. But what's not in the film was that my wife and I have a great couples therapist after year two and three. <laughs> that was how we were able, he's able to buy a summer house now, but we still live in one. <laughs> I had to get over that part when he was showing Secret the pictures of the house. <laughs> no, um, but it was really hard. Um, it's, 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 I think what, to, if you, if you can, there was a moment in the film, it's really the most important moment to me, and it's talking about the return of the microorganisms. And if, if you can just really like let that wash over you for a second, you know those moments you have when you look out in the space, and you're like, oh my gosh, we're actually on this thing spinning, and it like, it's with you for a moment, and then it goes away. Like You really are able to see how all this kind of comes together. If every once in a while, more often than not, I can get that flash and understanding of how the soil is working to kind of break down the decay of all death and turn it back into life. And I think what I, what I like thinking about is that death is not it. It's not over. And, and there's something about that, you know, even that I know that Todd right now is buried out by the house and 150 feet over is a, a ginkgo biloba tree that he's feeding because of mycorrhizae fungi and the mycelia that connect those nutrients. It's not over. Beautiful. I think my favorite fun fact about, yeah, snaps, applause, all the feels. <laughs> my favorite fun fact about healthy soil is that in one teaspoon of healthy soil, you can, that can support up to one billion microorganisms, bacteria, fungi, microbes, earthworms, ants, just the whole lot. It's insane. It's actually, not to correct you, but it's nine billion. Oh. Nine billion. Yeah. Well, so even nine, more. <laughs> and it's one billion bacteria and nine billion microorganisms, which would include there all the fungi. Anyway, so. <laughs> Thank you. Let's go into the back right there. Yeah, how important was it to have the well? Really important. And that's the thing. I, first of all, if you leave here with any, nothing else, please leave here with this. Stop using the word sustainable. It's like all natural Nature Valley granola bars. There's no accountability for what sustainable is, all right? There is no farm in Southern California in the current conditions that I know of, unless they're growing cactus, that's sustainable, including ours. But what we need to be focused on is regeneration, because water is a finite source beneath our, soil, beneath our, um, our grounds, right? Um, it's contained within an aquifer that gets, it's refilled by rainwater, essentially. And if we're not growing cover crops to sequester that water and we're letting it run out to the ocean, then that's not a sort of a sustainable regenerative source. So the water that rained here in last, what is it, uh, this year, we got 24 inches of rain, which is 20 <laughs> inches more in that year that I would get in most years. We were getting like four to five. And on our farm with 24 inches, the calculation for sequestration is 140 million gallons of water that didn't leave our farm. 
And we use 10 to 35% less water than our allocated amount in comparison to our neighbors. So having the aquifer is one thing, but maintaining practices that regenerate it is everything. Thanks. <laughs> I love all the enthusiasm. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's, an, there's a tendency to forget that soil can act as that natural sponge, that natural reservoir that's right underneath our feet, and it's important to invest in it. Yes. Absolutely. All right, all the way in the back row, the person who went like this. Yeah. The one on my left, your right. Jean Jacket. Lice guess? Uh, guest worker program. Uh, we have, we, we, we do volunteers. source a lot of volunteers from the uh, Wolf uh, USA Worldwide Opportunity on Organic Farms. If, if any of you are thinking about farming, go volunteer through the Wolf organization first. Um, farms like us have a, you know, a, a, a splash page on their website and they sign up from all over the world. Um, we run an intern program, uh, probably about f you know, five to eight of them. Uh, a lot of the people that work on the farm full-time now came through that program. Some have been there as long as six and a half years. Um, and right now the farm is seasonally, we're almost 65 people. Because everything with our operation is about selling direct because we need to make three times the amount. So if we sell to a packing house, they take their cut and then they sell the retail, right? So, and then they take their cut. So. Everything about a farm like this for it to work is about a direct relationship with the consumer, which is great because what it ultimately means is that we're reestablishing, you know, the, 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 the culture of agriculture into the community. And so I think it's really important that we recognize, you know, that relationship, but it needs to be a direct local food economy. That's how it's going to work. Somehow we got it in our mind we, that farms are supposed to grow food for the world. You wouldn't believe how much food that's grown in Ventura County gets shipped out of the state. There's nine million people here. That's not sustainable, you know. But we should at least have farms that grow food for you guys. Amen. Let's go to here. How's Emma? Uh, she's good. She's uh, sh felt 650 pounds. <laughs> retired. Uh, she's right outside of the barn by my office. Um, no more breeding for her. Uh, we call her a little valley now, Shady Acres uh, Retirement <laughs> Center. <laughs> but she's doing really well. She's she's a she's a hit. All the kids love her. Yes, we grow. Do we raise any of our animals for food? Yes. Um, and I'm and I'm sure. And first, let me just say that we also have vegans and vegetarians that work on our farm. And, and I think we need vegans, vegetarians, and meat eaters. We need the diversity. What we need too is also everyone to understand the purpose of the purpose of impermanence. And that does not negate the responsibility for humane treatment. And I also feel that you know meat is too cheap, and cheaply priced meat does not allow a farmer, for sure, to treat an animal humanely. Mm. And the methods of CAFOS operations have been a direct result of that, right? <laughs> Right, right here. What, what would need to be done to scale this up to get rid of factory farms? What would need to be done to scale this up to get rid of factory farms? It's a really good question, and it's the exact opposite way I would say we need to look at it. The question is, what would we do, what would we need to do to replicate farms like this, small farms coming back online where farmers are growing food for the community and able to feed their families off the farm. Like right now, I grew up in the eastern shore of Maryland, you know, and I, corn and soy farms. Everyone went to the grocery store to go buy food. There was a farmer. That's, that wasn't normal 60 years ago, right? 70 years, whatever. So I think the idea is that more farms like this are popping up, you know, and it's the smaller farms collectively kind of in an artisan way coming together to help support cities. Um, I had this really interesting like thought once, like you know how like in New York City there's like a six, 60 story building, and then beneath that 60 story building there's a there's a food store, there's a pizza shop, there's a barber shop, there's a something else and a something else, and then you go a block, repeat. How come there isn't one barber shop that serves all, all uh, you know serves all of New York City? 
You know, and so that's the way we look at farms. One farm is supposed to serve everything for everyone else, you know, and I think that I think that's part of the problem, you know. Is there legislation that this would help them at all? The legislation is called your dollar and how you vote with it, <laughs> for real, right? Because, uh, I, again, I don't think it's going to, there's so many young farmers that want to farm in this way that their parents are like, it's not going to work, no one's going to support it. And all they need is the consumer demand for it. And there is no reason why uh, the Bay Area is beating us in terms of like food savvy consumers. Like this is a really healthy group of people over here on the west side. So, and I think it's changing, you know, I think it's changing. The neighbors around us, I'm seeing them grow cover crops and, you know, I'm seeing them, their children wanting to get into this kind of thing. Right. I'll take a 20 seconds to weigh in on the legislation since I am a policy wonk in this space. Um, so California, thankfully, is one of the leaders in investing in healthy soil. We have a pretty robust healthy soils initiative and healthy soils program in the state. And the governor recently announced a $10 million increase in the budget that he initially came out with last year. Um, so we have hopefully $28 million going towards the Healthy Soils program in the state, and that goes towards funding things like cover crops and hedgerows and crop diversity and pollinator habitats. So we're moving in the right trajectory in the state. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Nationally, I think you need to look at the federal crop insurance program, but you and I can have a debate about that <laughs> later. <laughs> All right, let's get some more questions in. Gentleman right here, looking at you, yeah. Thank you. I'm not a National Geographic photographer, but I appreciate the... <laughs> I was debating whether to like tell you. <laughs> I was like letting in myself enjoy that for a while. Like, well, so um, so uh, thank you. I know I, it was a compliment. I appreciate it. Um, uh, uh, year five was the, the time. I, I never planned on making a film. I never thought that there was a real story to tell other than my like wife and I like floundering around like fish out of water and I didn't know enough about really even what we were doing or whether it would work but I kept documenting it and didn't know if what I was shooting mattered and then at year five it all came came together and I saw you know to the UN study um, about biodiversity I saw literally the return of biodiversity and I saw how it was complexly intertwined and f affecting things that and change and uh, fixing things that were problems. And at that moment, I knew who was going to spend any of this, any time, who was going to spend the amount of time I've spent inside the engine of an ecosystem, inside the engine of a story, and capturing it in that very um, specified cinematic way. And it just hit me that there was a real opportunity for something to share. And I almost felt like a debt of, you know, the gratitude and reverence for the gift that I've been given to do this. And so we spent the next three, uh, three years doing it more formally. And it was, you know, initially it started with interns helping me. You know, I would put them out and say, until you see honeydew come out the backside of that aphid, this is where you're going to live. <laughs> and then I, then I brought some, um, some professional guys that I had worked with in the past and some new ones, but never a crew of more than, like, what, two people, Sandra. It was very small. You know, but you would see these rhythms. You would see, all right, well, that's where the Cooper's hawk's going to, she's going to nest there again. And every time you go up to that nest, she's going to attack you. So you're going to get a shot. You see her dive. You know, so you would see these things. I, I watched Greasy and Emma, for an, another example, I watched them do that little dance of going to bed every night 30 times until I realized, I was like, I should probably shoot that. <laughs> you know? I'm going to leave that one. Uh, <laughs> now that first of all, I love you. You're great. Um, the chicken did not impregnate the pig. Um, but I did insinuate that that's what happened. So fairness to you. And let me tell you something. My wife was really upset because we just printed up shirts. And it says, it's greasy, the rooster. And it says, I'm not the father. And my, my wife and Sandra were both like, that's really inappropriate. <laughs> and I'm like, hold on. I anthropomorphize a sexual relationship between a rooster and a pig. They had 17 or 13 babies together, and the T-shirt that just that writes all those wrongs is inappropriate. Wait, so did they go to print? 
They're on, yeah, they're, and they, they're not. They're yeah, they're online. available <laughs> online. <laughs> it goes to Emma and Gracie's Children's College Fund. So. <laughs> Great. Let's get one more question. Anyone have a burning one? Ooh, yeah. Let's do. Am I concerned about fire? Um, no, it's a good question. I, uh, we got interviewed by NPR the other day, and they said, Are you, do you have methods to deal with the fires? And I said, yeah, we just rake the forest floor. Oh, no. <laughs> That's as political as I get, but that was pretty good. Um, we, no, we, we, um, we understand the way they work better. It's still, and it blows at 70 miles an hour. It didn't used to, in the beginning it was 35 to 45, these Santa Anas. Now they're like 70 miles, I mean, no lie, 65, 70. Um, our farm's pretty well, you know, irrigated, and we don't allow a lot of dead to brush to sort of um, collect, you know, so we're pretty good about that. Um, but, you, you know, eucalyptus trees are like Roman candles. There's that oil in those things. I don't know how we would fare with the structures, but I know the animals, we would we move them into f you know wider pastures where there's not a giant tree you know, on uh, the leeward side of the wind. Um, I don't know, for some reason, I feel like less nervous about it because I understand it, but we did invest in buying this old fire truck. I don't know what we're gonna do with it. I think we'll drive it off the farm after with to get Molly's yo uh, yoga roller or whatever out. So <laughs> it is really, it's really scary. Um, and I don't mean to downplay it, but I, I don't know there's a perfect answer answer for it, you know. I wish I, I wish I had a better answer. So I'll close this evening. You have a very attentive audience in this theater. Uh, what's one question that you want us to ask ourselves the next time we go to a grocery store or a farmer's market or the next time we're ordering things in an imperfect produce box or whatever it is, what's one thing that you think we should ask ourselves before we hit the submit button or pay at the register? I'm going I'm to try to, uh, hopefully, this is going to be a little more complex, I think. But I get this, I, I always felt like, I have, even up until recently, I feel like the human race is like cancer, right? And I hate that, that I think that. And I, I, started, I actually went, talked to my uh, cousin who's an oncologist, and I'm like, what is cancer? Like, what is it, what's its purpose? Does it, does, is it conscious of what it's doing? And he's like, you know, no, it's sort of, it's a cell that figures out how to live forever by basically just, you know, stealing the nutrients of everything around it and replicating itself as this, another cell that can live forever until essentially its host dies. And I'm like, but it's not, no, but, but yeah, I know that's what I thought, but, but that's, uh, it's unconscious of that, of its demise that's imminent. And, it's an incredible force, right? And I, and, I, and I like to think that, you know, not like to think, meaning we are biology, we are nature, we are an incredible force of nature. And the last 260 years, we've depleted the topsoils by a third, right? We've um, doubled carbon dioxide levels, 260 to 400 parts per million. We've deforested 46% of the trees. But we've done that unconsciously. And so I think with that same force of nature that we inadvertently did that destruction with, I think we could have a profound effect in a much shorter period of time because we're more conscious. And I gotta tell you, I have a lot of hope for, especially what I see in, in young people coming up, I mean, from third graders up, who are just so much more aware of this stuff. It just makes sense to them, you know? And they don't ask the question of like, well, is it economically viable? <laughs> because there's no economy without the finite resources that nature provides to a stable economy. So I have great hope for the fact that we are a force of nature and we can make decisions differently. And we're imperfect and not all of us are gonna be able to make our lives fit perfectly within those ideals, but I think just have consciousness for how incredibly powerful you are. When is the next tour? <laughs> when is the next tour? Uh, there's a tour in June, we do one tour one tour weekend a month, roughly, if we can handle it. Um, I don't know if there might be some, you can, I think it's June 1st or 2nd? June 1st and 2nd. Um, you can go online, apricotlanefarms.com. Um, but look, you know, uh, go to farmer's markets. 
that's a really important thing. The, the farmer makes, you know, 100%. Um, and ask questions about how they farm. You know, you know some stuff now. And uh, be kind to them, because they're all trying. Thank you. And Another huge round oh, of applause for John. Tell your friends to come see the movie. <laughs> Thank you all. Thanks, everyone.